वेलकम डॉक्टर रतन झा रतन झा जी भी हैं वो वो तो उसमें नहीं होंगे ना ही इज रेगुलर नहीं नहीं ही इज पढ़ाकू आदमी है भाई पढ़ाकू आदमी बहुत पहले से ही पढ़ाकू था ही वॉज वेरी हार्ड वर्किंग ड्यूरिंग इज डी एम तो वी आर ऑन एयर तो ही यूज टू बी इन द वर्ड मिड नाइट एंड नर्स इज यूज टू गेट फूड फॉर हिम टेकिंग पिटी ऑन हिम इनके डीएनबी के एग्जाम डीएनबी के एग्जाम कब स्टार्ट हो रहे हैं थ्योरी तो मेरे ख्याल अक्टूबर में है टेंथ और इलेवेंथ समथिंग लाइक दैट ओके समवेयर इन अक्टूबर ओके calendar. and we are very happy to to uh, welcome our course director dr vijay kumar as well dr lakshman general tp verma for today's program so i'm sure uh, today's session will be as interesting as your previous session uh, we look forward for your constant feedback that is encouragement for us so kindly feel free to share your feedback uh, during the programs and the after course program so now i request dr tp verma ji to welcome the discussions for the day and take the session from here Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Raja, and welcome all the students and faculty for this third uh, episode of uh, challenging cases. This time in field of transplantation. Today we have got uh, two very dynamic, not very young, not very old members of nephrology faculty. very learned teachers fine clinicians who are going to discuss two cases uh, i think both the moderators are not well versed what are the cases in detail but i think uh, the examiners will conduct the cases and discuss them the first case is being discussed by dr suman lata she is director of nephrology at fortis hospital new delhi and the second case will be discussed by dr ajay kher who is a director nephrology and transplantation at epitome uh, kidney institute in delhi i think uh, before uh, going for the cases i hand over to professor kher to say a few words and then we start the case thank you thank you general verma uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome Uh, again to another episode of challenging cases in uh, nephrology and this time it's going to be kidney transplantation and as dr verma said that i think two interesting cases uh, one by dr suman lata and one by ajay uh, i think let's go straight without any ado i think i'll ask dr suman lata to uh, present the first case and then we will go over the cases and then see what happens welcome again dr suman it's all yours yeah good evening sir and good evening everyone and uh, let me check my screen can you see my slides no not yet i, I think they yet. you will have to remove this uh, again first uh, and then, yeah now we can see yeah, that right. yeah we can see that okay fine i think it's not moving slides are not moving let me check yes it's not moving i think so. not it's not moving let me restart yeah restart can you see my slides not yet okay just a second what the chart is
Yeah, we can yeah. see the slide now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now you can see. Yeah. Yeah. But make it yeah. full screen. Yeah, I think it's full screen only. Sir. No, it's not full screen. Not is not. Full it's screen. not. Okay, let me check again. It's full screen, sir. Actually, can you see? No, actually, it's not. But you can go on like this also. That okay, fine, sir. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. P.P. Verma, sir, and Dr. Vijay K., Dr. Sakuja for giving me opportunity to speak on this forum. Today, I'll be presenting a challenging post-renal transplant patient. And the uh, heading for today's presentation is a post-transplant case, Armageddon is surviving ordeal. Here we have Mr. A.K., who is 42-year-old male, travel agent by occupation. He's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, not moving me. again. It's not moving. Okay. No, it's not. It's not, it's not moved. Just a second, sir. If it then maybe they have a backup. Yes, yes. Just a second. So let me try. Can you see? Yeah, we can see the slide, but it's again it's not, not full. Yes, it's, ma'am. It's, it's not full screen and it's not moving also. Moving also. So I'll request Mr. Deepak actually to share the slide from his end. Mr. Deepak, wow. can you please okay. share my slides? Okay, okay ma'am. So you can okay, maybe yeah. stop sharing. So maybe I... stop sharing. Yeah, okay, fine. Yes. Yeah. I think it was sharing and we did it <laughs> run also. Yeah, that's sure. the, this is what happens, the technical hitches. Computer. Yes. Yeah. You okay. never know when they give up. Okay. Yeah. Can you see, ma'am? No, we not yet. Not but yet. We can see your screen. Open, open we need to. You need, you need to, open, to open, open the slides. You need to open the presentation. Yeah. Uh, there will be a thirty second delay, madam. When you open yeah, 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 yeah. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Can, is it moving? Uh, Sachin, try the next slide. Yes. Next slide. No. Yeah, it's yeah. moving now. Yes. Yes. I think we can go to the next slides. Okay. Yeah. So here is Mr. A.K., who is 42-year-old male, travel agent by occupation. He is non-diabetic, hypertensive, and his basic disease was FSGS biopsy proven, done at some private hospital. He was listed for the disease kidney transplant as no suitable donor in the family. Next slide, please. Next one, please. So these are the recipient details. His uh, uh, height was 177 centimeter. His weight was 65 kg. BMI was 23. He was hypertensive. He was on three antihypertensive. And his basic disease was FSGS. He was on maintenance hemodialysis on thrice per week. And excess was left radiocephalic fistula, and which was created in 2013. His native urine output on dialysis was 1.5 liter per day. He also had history of tubercular lymphadenitis, right cervical, which was treated two years ago. His cardiac function was normal. Left ventricle ejection fraction was 60%. There was no history of any blood trans transfusion and his blood group was A positive. On 26 January 2015, we got a call for the disease uh, kidney donation, and the disease was 16 months, a uh, male child. It was very unfortunate. Uh, he had blunt trauma head due to fall from height, and the father was working in my hospital, and he was declared brain dead in two independent neurological examination trial hours apart on 25th June 2015. Family was very keen for the donation, therefore the consent for the organ harvesting from the parents were taken. 
and donor was hemodynamically stable. He was not on any inotropic support. He had urine output of about 20 to 30 ml per hour. His blood group was A positive, viral markers were negative, right kidney was 5.3, left kidney was 5.2 centimeter. Next one. We have two uh, recipient listed with the same blood group. Uh, there were two potential recipient. Uh, one was Mr. MR, 14 year old male, and second was Mr. AK, 42 year old male. Uh, we consider initially the pediatric because we have pediatric donor and it's very logical we should consider the pediatric recipient. But somehow we have to reject Mr. MR because of the thickened bladder. He also had active infection. Probably he was under evaluated for the transplant at this particular point of time and his lower urinary tract needs proper evaluation before the transplant. Finally, we may selected uh, Mr. AK for the disease kidney donation uh, transplant. He was fit for transplant. His CDC flow cross match was negative. Next one. Organ harvesting and uh, was started uh, diseased donor deemed fit for the liver and kidney harvesting. Access to portal vein and iota via left femoral artery established. Intracorporeal eye school perfusion with a custodial solution was done. Liver was removed first and kidney removed and block with iota and IVC from the infrahepatic portion till bifurcation in the iliac vessels. And ureters were also dissected till their insertion in the bladder. Thank you. Next one, yeah. So you can see in this slide, there are three levels of transaction. The first level of the transaction was the above the origin of the renal arteries. Second level of the transaction was above the bifurcation of the external iliac artery and the vein. And the next was up to the origin of the ureters into the bladder. So these were the level of transaction and kidneys were removed and block with the iota and IVC with the both the ureters. Next one. You can see actually the bench dissection and uh, uh, these are the two small kidney, right, left and IVC. And uh, you can see the iota also, both the ureters. And uh, on the left side, there's a diagrammatic presentations of the end block kidneys. Next one. Recipient surgery uh, was planned and modified Gibson in season was given extra peritoneal space created in the right iliac fossa, external iliac vessels skeletonized, and donor IVC to the external iliac vein and to side anostomosis was done. Donor iota to the external iliac artery and to side anostomosis was done. Heparin 5000 given before opening clamps as we were over cautious because we were dealing here with a pediatric donor who is just 16 months old and uh, we gave the heparin just to prevent the thrombosis. After opening clamps, kidney become pink and larger and thrill felt in the donor iota and both the donor renal arteries. Brisk urine output seen in both the ureters and modified Lich Gregoria urethro neocystotomy done over 4 by 16 DJ stand for both the ureters separately. Next one. This is again the diagrammatic presentation. You can see the right kidney, left kidney, and IVC anastomosis was done with the external iliac vein and the donor iota with the external iliac artery. And on the left side, you can see the back side of the, all the arteries, the tributaries were ligated, upper end of the IVC as well as the iota was stretched. And uh, next one. This is the Doppler we done in the OT. You can see both the kidneys right as well as the left and the, both the small kidneys. And uh, the RI was okay. And uh, next one. This is a little bit about the pre and post of management, although it was not much difference. Induction, we gave ATG plus steroids. We continued with the triple immunosuppressions. As uh, this was our first experience of N block, and we were concerned about the thrombosis, we used intraop heparin and we continued with the injection claxin for the first post of week. We continued with the overhydration till post of day seven, daily renal graft doctor was done. We also gave injection albumin for the first seven days. 
adequate dose of immunosuppression was given as per the level. And just like the, we managed like the adult renal allograft, we tried to avoid hypertension and hypotension, which we routinely do, do in the transplant patient. But in this patient, we were concerned about the thrombosis, so we were careful about the blood pressure. Next one. So you can see the graph of the post-op uh, graft function by the end of 10th and 11th day. We reached the nadir creatine of 1.2, 1.3. Next one. And uh, we did the daily Doppler and, uh, and uh, the ultrasound also. And you can see by the end of two weeks, the kidney length increased from 5.5 to 7.5 centimeter within two weeks. RI was okay. Next one. So here we are dealing with an ABO compatible N block kidney transplant. Induction was given steroids plus ATG and the nadir creatine on follow up point eight. Coming to the post transplant course of this patient, his follow up and compliance was very good. He was very well aware about because he was on dialysis for two years and he, he understood the importance of this kidney. And uh, he used to come very regularly. Whenever I called him, he was very regular with the follow up. His baseline creatine remained 0.7 to 1. There was no proteinuria. He had hypertension, which was well controlled with the ARBs and calcium journal blockers. He was on amlodipine 5 milligram once a day and tell me certain 40 milligram once a day. Post transplant course, I will say it was very smooth and calm. From 2015 to 2021, there was no history of hospitalization, just a couple of viral illness, which was managed from outer. So till 2021, there was no history of hospitalization. Next one. But we all know the medicine is a science of uncertainty and art of probability, as said by uh, William Osler. Next one. On 20... 12th November 2021, he presented to me in the transplant clinic with a pain in the back and numbness by little lower limb for two days prior to admission. There was catch in the history, actually. He told me very categorically he, he was playing badminton and he used to play badminton on a daily basis. He's a quite sporty and fit person. And when he was playing badminton, there was a jerk he felt. And after that, is this pain started. And he also noticed he also had decreased urine output for the last one day, no history of any fever like systemic infection. I ordered routine investigations and MR scan to rule out any local injury, but somehow I advise admission and why I advise admission in this patient. I, next one. First of all, this patient was very uh, intelligent person. He never complained of decreased urine output till now. Although the symptoms very non-specific, another thing which I notice on the clinical exam, he also has low blood pressure, 104 by 66. There was no tachycardia, weight was 74. He was very well conscious oriented, respiratory rate was 20. Temperature was normal. All the systemic exam were normal. Chest was fine, spine was normal. No neurological deficit and saturation. He was maintaining 98% on the room air. Now, coming to the lab chart, in last follow-up was in September 2021. His creatine was 0.8, urea was 30, urine was bland, sugar was fine, BP was well controlled. On 12th November, he presented to me and creatine. I got a call from the lab. The creatine went up to 2.8. TLC was 10,300. You can see HB is 11.9, albumin is 3.8, liver functions were okay. So these were the only tests available which I ordered from the OPD. And the next day morning, it went up to 4.1 and then 5.1. And his, his TLC also went up to 16,000. He also developed bit low sodium, also had decreased urine output. Next one. So my working diagnosis with all this investigation till now was disease and block ABO compatible transplant and with acute graft dysfunctions, maybe because of ATN ischemic or maybe some underlying sepsis because he was on immunosuppression. He might, uh, sometimes the transplant patient might not throw fever or full-blown symptoms and signs of sepsis. 
hypotension, maybe because of sepsis, or maybe I think I'm missing some cardiac event in this patient. And in the late afternoon, and I got a call from my radiologist, and here you can see, which I've marked in the circle, there was a notorious thing on the MR, MR scan, which I ordered to rule out the any disc because I failed in diagnosing in this patient in the transplant clinic. And I can see uh, the radiologist told me there is uh, evidence of aortic dissection, and they can see the intimal flap. Next slide. And then we did the CT iotogram. Once we got the call uh, from the radiologist, we planned for immediately in the evening CT iotogram. And you can see there's a beautiful intimal flap and you can see the true and false lumen. And there was type A aortic dissection involving the ascending iota and it was extending up to the iliac vessels. Next one, please. Next one. Uh, we did the echo also immediately. There was type 2 diastolic dysfunction, concentric LVF, severe AR, eccentric moderate MR, no TR, RA and RV were not dilated. There was good LV and RV systolic function. Ejection fraction was 60%. No evidence of any pericardial effusion. Next one. So now my final diagnosis with the, all these findings on CT and MR and with all the labs, uh, here I was dealing with a diseased and block ABO compatible kidney transplant type A acute aortic dissection with a severe AR normal LV function and acute graft dysfunction was probably the pre-renal secondary to hyperperfusion because probably the intimal flap was affecting the flow to the graft artery and it is leading to the hemodynamic compromise of the graft kidney. Uh, we all know the misfortune sometimes doesn't come alone. And on that particular day, my interruption, uh, it was only type A dissection. Yes, sir. It was not, type not A. Not extending yes. to descending aorta. No, sir. It was only type A aortic dissection. Yeah. Okay. And uh, on that particular day, my surgeon was not available on 12th November. I immediately uh, called uh, Gangaram Hospital and I spoke to Dr. Bhalla there and uh, bed was not uh, available immediately, but, uh, and I explained about the patient, like he's a post-transplant patient with aortic. He immediately helped me out and arranged a bed and he operated on the next day morning on 30th November, 2021, underwent dental procedure plus aortic wall graft mechanical processes. His urine output improved and graft function normalized in a couple of days. He did not require any dialysis. Uh, he had aneurysmal dilatation of the left radiocephalic fistula. And as per vascular surgeon advice, it was ligated. And currently, he's on anticoagulant plus triple drug immunosuppression. And he's maintaining of creatine point eight, and urine is also blank. Now coming to the challenges in this patient, and we all know the transplant patient through a lot of challenges in the, their journey. First was end block kidney transplant, and uh, second was aortic dissection, which was unusual cause of the post-transplant graft dysfunction. Next one. So you can see this end block kidney transplant. Uh, next one. So uh, why we are uh, you know, scared with the pediatric donors and pediatric end block kidneys or single uh, pediatric kidney transplant? Because they are uh, traditionally considered to be marginal for transplantation in adult because of various technical difficulties in salvage and transplant and more risk of graft failure, high risk of graft thrombosis because of the smaller vessel size, kidney torsion, hyperfiltration injury because of the suboptimal nephron mass. Previous studies have also reported higher incidence of trash thought to be related to the small caliber of the renal artery, which is to the tune of 6.4%. Ureterocystostomy of pediatric kidneys is at an increased risk of developing complications with an incidence ranging from 2.5 to 11% because of the short length of the ureter and the meager blood supply. And the chance of the vascular thrombosis is such kind of the donor is up to the tune of the 10%. 
There is evidence that the pediatric and block kidneys undergo compensatory growth when exposed to the adult blood flow and metabolic demands. In one study, the end block kidneys grew twofold by three to six months and nearly threefold by the six months after transplant. End block addresses the challenges of the small caliber of the pediatric vessel as well as the low nephron mass. If you give the two kidneys, actually the small kidney, it will add to the nephron mass and the challenges of the small pediatric vessels are also less. Next one. This is a very interesting uh, study published in the Transplant 2017. They look at actually the uh, maturation of the glomerulus size and podocyte in the recipient of a nine month old donor to adult recipient. And their findings suggested that the podocyte and the glomerulus size of the pediatric donor kidney can continue to mature in adult recipient at rates appropriate for donor age when transplanted and blocked. The maturation level of the podocyte and the glomeruli may be a factor involved in the favorable outcome of n block pediatric kidney transplant. Next one. So this is the latest Doppler and ultrasound of my patient. And it was done a couple of months back. You can see the good Doppler and uh, two beautiful kidney enlarged, the size of 8.7, 8.5. Next one. This is one of the latest DTPA GFR and the GFR latest is 79.1 ml. Next one. We published this case in 2017, Indian Journal of Urology, and this was well covered. This was the youngest uh, uh, pediatric donor and block donor at that point of time, but later on the PGI and the other group also published. Next one. So this was the uh, case report uh, published in 2019 from PGI group. And the lower one also, it was one of the earlier case report from the uh, IKDRC and they published this uh, case report in 2009. And they uh, reported the follow-up after the two years and five months post-transplant of the recipient, the creatine was 0.9 normal blood flow on Doppler ultrasound, each kidney size 11.3, no proteinuria and hypertension, and GFR reported at two years, five months after the transplant was 88. Next one. This is another study which uh, looked into the long-term outcomes of the pediatric and block compared to the living donor kidney transplantation, single center experience with 20 years follow-up. And they compared the 72 pediatric end block and 75 living donor kidney recipient were included in the analysis. And uh, next one, please. Next slide, please. And look at this graph survival is almost equal between the end block and the living donor. Next one. And if we look at the long-term GFR of end block and living donor, end block did fairly well. The GFR was good as compared to the living donor. Next one. Uh, coming to the concluding point about the end block kidney transplant, I think the graft survival tell us that the pediatric donor should not be considered as marginal transplant. It will expand the donor pool. Challenge is to perform a pediatric end block kidney transplant as, as opposed to the splitting and performing two simultaneously kidney transplant. Unfortunately, there are no widely accepted guidelines to direct clinician, but generally most of the paper says like if the weight is less than 10 kg, age is less than two years of the donor kidney length is less than six centimeter you consider for the end block. But if age is more, weight is more, then we can split this kidney into the two recipients because it will expand the donor pool. Now coming to uh, this post kidney, second challenge, post kidney transplant, aortic dissection. Aortic dissection as a cause of graft dysfunction is very uncommon. When I was looking into the literature, hardly there were any literature actually for the transplant kidneys. I could find one case report and that was also very interesting. The patient got admitted with a graft dysfunction. Everything was done like including graft biopsy where they couldn't find even the Doppler was okay. 
CRP was elevated persistently. Therefore, they order for the CT chest to rule out the infection. And on CT, they found there is aortic dissection, type B aortic dissection. So that was one case report I have seen. Symptoms of aortic dissection may be highly variable and may mimic much more common conditions. Like most of the time, if you look, this patient will sometime admitted in the neurology ward with a TIA or stroke because of the cerebral malperfusion. And uh, sometimes they are admitted in the CCO because with the coronary artery syndrome syndromes, because what happens when the coronary artery ostia is affected, actually there is malperfusion and it can lead to the symptoms like the coronary artery disease. Therefore, they mimic much more common conditions. And uh, what are the risk factors for the aortic dissection? Male sex, uncontrolled blood pressure, and graft dysfunction in the post transplant These are the risk factors for the aortic dissection. I think uh, the hypothesis in my patient is probably his aorta could have been damaged by the long-term hypertension and by a turbulent flow which was induced by the AV fistula, which may have induced the weakness of the media. The risk factor for aortic dissection, unstable BP. He, this BP was controlled on two antihypertensive, but what we can see a lot of, you know, the sports person dying on the spot because of the sometimes aortic dissection can happen because there is a sudden surge in the blood pressure because of this high strenuous activity that, which can increase the blood pressure. This could be one reason for, in my patient. And he was having an underlying atherosclerotic disease because he was on dialysis prior to the transplant for almost two years. His basic disease was FSES, he received steroids also. So maybe uh, underlying atherosclerotic disease, unstable blood pressure and underlying AV fistula which I never monitor the Doppler blood flow and we most of the time forget actually and uh, the fish lovers working this could, could be a cul uh, culprit actually in precipitating the aortic dissection. The vast majority of patients with acute dissection have sudden severe chest, back and abdominal pain which may be maximal at its onset. I think I couldn't suspect aortic dissection. He was giving history of all the, he was giving history of backache uh, his BP was okay. He was walking. He came walking, talking, and he was not describing pain typical like uh, ripping, tearing kind of pain, uh, which we thought, uh, which will lead to the, you know, the diagnosis we presume actually it could be aortic dissection. The pain may be migratory or may radiate from chest or back to the abdomen to the lower extremities. However, in some instances, the pain resolves and symptoms may be referable to other complications such as heart failure from acute AR, neurological deficit, syncope, or vascular insufficiency. Type A dissections are normotensive or hypotensive on presentation. My patient had hypotension because he was on two hypertensive and his BP was 104. 104. Hypotension complicating acute aortic dissection is usually related with a cardiac tamponade, aortic rupture, or heart failure associated with a severe AR. Sudden chest or back pain accompanied by the pulse deficit AR or neurological manifestation should alert the clinician to the diagnosis of aortic dissection. However, pulse deficit were present in only 19% of type A dissection and 9% of type B dissection. But frankly speaking, I did not look for the pulse deficit in this patient in the OPD. My takeaway point uh, for aortic dissection is early and accurate diagnosis and treatment are crucial for survival. Proper history and examination is very important. And today also in the era of artificial intelligence. Hypertension management, management, one of the most important predisposing factor for the aortic dissection. I think in the post-transplant, sometimes we are lagging behind actually, and we don't pay attention. And this is a very important part. Mortality related to aortic dissection is high. However, advances in the surgical and endovascular technique have lowered the mortality rate overall for those who are diagnosed and treated in timely fashion. Next one. Severe aortic dissection can be responsible of graft failure and graft dysfunction. This diagnosis should be considered mostly in patients with uncontrolled BP, 
vague and transient neurological disorder and biological positivity of inflammatory markers. Contrast CT is the best procedure for the diagnosis. Rise of inflammatory markers, it has been seen if D-dimer is more than 500 that can support the diagnosis of aortic dissection, but you, you can see high D-dimer in a lot of the condition, even the other cardiac conditions also. Next one. I think I, I will fail in presenting today if I don't pay my gratitude to the donor and the family who agreed to donate the kidneys of their little child. And I pay my sincere thanks to the surgery and nephrology team at Sagangaram Hospital who timely took the patient and immediately planned for the surgery and saved the patient's life. Next one. We all deal with the transplant challenges, but at the end of day, I will see the transplant changes life. And you can see the smiling face of my transplant patient. And on the left side, he's enjoying on the vacation, having his lunch on Sukhdevi Dhaba, and he's ready for the river rafting also. Truly the transplant changes life. I think that's all for today. And thank you so much for the patient listening. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Professor Sumalata, I think, uh, no doubt, fantastic and uh, very nice case. Nice. Though we all know this is a very unusual case of uh, rejection or graft dysfunction, not rejection, graft dysfunction. The congratulations are, as you have rightly said, to the team for taking an end block, which is not a very common thing. Yes. And even in big cities, I think uh, over a period of 20, 20 years, people have done 30 or 40 cases only. So yes. that's uh, uh, very creditable. And the message is that, yes, the pediatric transplant for n block kidneys can be taken and can be successfully uh, implanted in a young, in an adult. Yes, sir. Number two, as you said, the... The patient hardly had any symptoms suggestive of the aortic dissection. Uh, just a back pain while playing badminton, just a jerk. And possibly one will not think of anything like that. The yes. only inklings you had was that possibly you said there was numbness in the lower extremities and there was a drop in BP. But yes. still, they, they were not enough to give an idea that is a dissection. Yes. And... Uh, and again, as you said, once the dissection was picked up, give credit to the radiology team also. But yes. they are at times, they picked up the case. And after that, timely, whatever bental procedure was done, that possibly the patient is saved. And if yes. the patient is not saved, logically, the subsequently the graft automatically got saved once yes. the dissection was taken. And dissection was only, you said, type A. It was yes. restricted to arch of aorta only. Yes. And the tear, tear was at the level of the mid-ascending aorta. Uh, because I could see the surgical notes of the Gangaram Hospital. Yeah. Obviously, I was not there, but I've seen the surgical notes. It was in the middle of the ascending aorta. The tear was there. Uh, I, I, If I recollect, I was very much there in uh, the I part of ILBS when this case was done. But logically... Yes. The, uh, the complication has been much later. Professor yes. Kinsa. Yeah, No, no, I think in a very interesting case, there's no doubt that uh, I, in my life, I haven't had a personal experience of an unblock uh, pediatric transplant, but I've seen patients who have been transplanted with unblocked kidneys. And I think it's logical that these two kidneys, uh, especially if the criteria which uh, Suman said, if you have a weight which is low, kidney sizes are very small. And, uh, and obviously, these two kidneys, once they grow in the transplant kidney, will be much better than uh, the living yeah. donor single kidney, even if this donor was, this recipient was to get a single kidney from a living donor. And as Suman has shown, the GFRs of two kidneys combined is 79 ML in this patient, which is definitely much better than the GFRs that you would see in most of your patients uh, yes. with kidney transplant. So I, I think from that perspective, end block kidney should be done. There's no doubt about that, uh, that this would be, especially if the criteria are fulfilled, then it's much better to give a good functioning renal mass 
to a recipient and give an opportunity for good functioning kidney uh, transplant. And uh, I think the clinicians who have been managing uh, this patient need congratulations because uh, one that initial management of the transplant because many of us are not been experienced personally with any big numbers of managing such patients. So obviously there would be a challenge of a, managing a new kind of a yes. transplant in such situation. So I think uh, from that perspective, it is good. Uh, second, that the second complication, unfortunately, that happened in this patient is again unusual, very unusual that you get a neotic dissection in a healthy, otherwise young person, but I, I agree that probably hypertension is is something which which is the culprit in this patient. And I feel that probably with long-standing chronic kidney disease on dialysis for some period of time and then transplantation, all of these predisposed to atherosclerosis and then uncontrolled hypertension might break one of those atherosclerotic plaques in the vessel and cause. He was lucky that it, it got sort of curtailed only in the upper part of the aorta. If it continued gone down, then he may have damaged a lot of other vessels and got into more complications yes. and all that. So from that perspective, he was lucky that it, it stopped uh, at the upper part of the aorta itself, ascending aorta, and did not go down. So it was only a type 1, uh, yes. type A uh, dissection, and he survived. Otherwise, he may have had a lot of other complications yes. and... And especially if intestinal or uh, ischemia would have occurred, then bacterial translocation and sepsis and all other complications yes. would have made yes. life more difficult. So thank you. Thank you, Suman, for that wonderful. Welcome. If there are any yeah. questions. Yes, uh, what, uh, to, uh, what is your uh, hypothesis why it occurred? Because all patients, CKD patients, transplant patients are hypertensive. Yes, sir. All require a couple of drugs. And he was no change, no different. He was also requiring two, uh, how many, two drugs? He was uh, on two drugs, two, two drugs, drugs yeah. only. And what prompted? We normally say that if a person has got some did marfan or whatever, some problem, and he was reasonably young person I, that way, yes, 40 sir. years? Yes, 42. 42. 42 years. What what really caused aortic dissection? I if think I agree with Dr. Kheer, actually, uh, the unstable blood pressure because he was playing badminton. And we keep on reading, actually, if you look at the uh, print reports, actually, the, a lot of sports players have sudden collapse on the grounds. Oh. I think aortic dissection is one of the possibility because sometimes there is sudden surge in the blood pressure when you are doing these strenuous activities. And underlying, I think his iota was also not healthy. Because he received steroid, he was on dialysis, and he had this medial weakness uh, near the muscle weakness. That is another thing. Third thing, I think maybe because of that turbulent flow, fascia, and which we haven't measured, actually, we don't routinely, and we forget, actually, in the post-transplantation. And uh, that is another culprit in this patient. Because I couldn't see any degenerative or genetic in this patient. This patient tolerated actually the procedure well transplant followed up for the couple of years and in the eco also except the concentric lvh and ar ar was a part of this uh, aortic dissection only so my strong so for students, uh, students who are listening because yeah. now he will be on anticoagulants throughout life yes now, any interaction of anticoagulant, because these days you are giving direct uh, acting, directly acting anticoagulants. Yes, sir. His graft function is good. You said creatine yes. is 0.8. 0.8, so yeah. The graft function is not there. And what is the interaction of these anticoagulants with tacrolimus? Because warfarin can interact with the, you know, the tacrolimus. But... Uh, I have seen, I am following his levels actually for the last couple of months and he is not requiring much change in the immunosuppression actually. I know, but he's on acetron right now. And acetron. Uh, yeah, not, uh, but possibly DOCA direct yes. acting anticoagulant. Yes. There is yes. some interaction. Yes. And yeah. uh, more with cyclosporin, less with the tetralimus. Yes. And the graph function is not good. 
a great name, suppose if two are something, one yes. should be aware that the dosing has to be different. Yes, yeah. Anything, uh, uh, Professor Kher, sir? Are we? No, no, I, I think no. I think that's all good. Great. Uh, I think this was a very, very interesting and very nice case. Uh, thank you, Suman. Very, thank very you, nice. Thank you, sir. No, we can probably start with the second case. We will request uh, Professor Ajay Kher to start the second case, please. Ajay, make it full screen. Yeah. So uh, thank you, and I hope everyone can hear me as well. So thank you yes. for the opportunity to present uh, this case. And I'll dive right in. So uh, we're going to be talking about a 30-year-old male. Uh, he had end-stage renal disease of unknown etiology. Uh, he did have pleural effusions at the time of uh, the uh, end-stage diagnosis. And uh, he also had history of multiple transfusions uh, that were there even before uh, he had chronic kidney disease. Uh, and that uh, was present as a child. And this is going to be important uh, when we talk about uh, what happens to him down the road. He got a transplant in uh, 2014, and uh, he had been uh, having good uh, kidney function with a creatinine in the 1.2 to 1.4 range. And uh, he had been following with a transplant program outside. Uh, he presented to the outside facility for fever of unknown origin and cytopenias in July of 2023. Uh, during that admission, which was a 15-day, 15-20 day admission, he had extensive workup for his fever, including CTs, bronchoscopy, PET CT, bone marrow biopsies. Uh, he had CMV, uh, EBV, parvovirus, all which were negative. Uh, he did have the bone marrow biopsy, which showed staph hominis, and uh, he had a direct Coombs test, which was positive. The bone marrow biopsy, as well as the aspirate, did not show any uh, HLH or hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. However, as the rest of the infectious workup was negative, and he had a very high ferritin with some uh, high triglycerides, he was diagnosed with HLH, uh, and uh, he was started on steroids. Uh, with the steroids, uh, his fevers improved and his cytopenia settled down as well. And then he was discharged with uh, steroids and planned for a taper. He went back to his home, which is in Punjab. And unfortunately, as his steroids were tapered, his fever record. Uh, he uh, was not keen on coming back to uh, Delhi NCR. And so he had some follow up as an uh, over the phone and teleconsultations and stuff like that. And he was started on IV antibiotics, but as he was not improving, uh, he decided to present to our institution in September. Uh, so by the time he presented to us in September, he had been having fever off and on for about one month. He had some dry cough and uh, he looked sick. Uh, this was our first time meeting him and he did have a childlike look and behavior and he was a thin gentleman. His vitals when he presented to us uh, had, uh, he was febrile with a temp of 99.3, uh, heart rate was 110, blood pressures were 110 by 70, and saturations were 99% on room air. He was thin, awake, uh, oriented. Uh, the rest of his exam was not remarkable. Uh, on exam, we were not able to palpate any hepatosplenomegaly, and he didn't have any nodes, either cervical, axillary, or inguinal nodes that were palpable. Uh, so his 15th July, when he was discharged, uh, his WBC count was 5.6. He was anemic with a hemoglobin of 7, but he didn't have any thrombocytopenia at that time. And his creatinine was at his baseline at 1.4. So when he presented to us, uh, his WBC count was 2.5. His hemoglobin was 9.9. and He was already thrombocytopenic with 60. He'd had poor intake as well, and his sodium was 114. And his creatinine had already increased to 2.5. He was also hypoalbuminemic with uh, the fever and not being uh, well over the last month or so. And his calcium uh, was appropriately low for his albumin. Uh, he did have some mild transaminitis with OTPTs in the hundreds. 
uh, he did have iron studies done to evaluate his anemia and his saturation was 30%. His ferritin was more than 2000 and on dilution came out at 43,000. His PTH was uh, high um, for his level of kidney function at 320. We had repeated his direct Coombs test because he had a positive one previously and the direct Coombs was negative and on his peripheral smear, there were no schistocytes. His CMV PCR and EBV DNA were done for his cytopenias and those were negative. As part of his HLH workup, he had a triglyceride of 287 and an LDH of 1668. We also worked up for secondary uh, in autoimmune causes and his ANA and rheumatoid factor were negative. His blood culture and urine cultures that were done uh, were negative. Coags were normal and his TAC level at that point was 7.7. .7. Uh, he also underwent um, a radiological workup to evaluate for infection. Um, and uh, they showed pleural effusions with his uh, hypoalbuminemia as well and a moderate pericardial effusion. Uh, he also had some bilateral maxillary sinusitis with a deviated septum. Uh, the ultrasound again showed ascites with mild splenomegaly and reactionary cholecystitis. So his hospital course, so in view of his previous HLA's diagnosis and his current workup, which showed a severely increased ferritin, negative infectious workup, uh, we also diagnosed him as HLS and started him on IV dexamethasone. Uh, for his pharyngitis and sinusitis, we did do a throat culture, which grew Klebsiella. His other cultures initially were negative. However, during his hospital stay, he had uh, a repeat a urine culture scent, which grew Candida tropicalis and an E. coli at a 10 is to 4 uh, uh, count. So once they came back, antibiotics and antifungal, uh, including casperfungin, were added. However, despite uh, the IV dexamethasone, his cytopenias worsened and required filgrastin. He also had hypofibrinogenemia and cryoprecipitates were transfused. A repeat ferritin on uh, six, which is five days after admission and dexamethasone had decreased from 43,000 to 26,000. But despite that, his fever and cytopenias persisted. He underwent a hematology review and uh, we decided to give him solumedrol as well as IVIG and uh, sent a genetic primary immunodeficiency panel as well. Unfortunately, it takes four weeks to come back. And so uh, that uh, was not available. So he received solumedrol one gram daily for three days, as well as an IVIG one uh, gram per kilogram, 50 grams. Uh, despite this treatment, he continued to have no response and then started developing echimosis and bleeding as well. So he was transferred to a hematology center uh, and underwent a repeat bone marrow. His previous bone marrow that was done in uh, July uh, did not have uh, uh, hemophagocytosis uh, seen and the HLH diagnosis was based on the clinical parameters. However, on this bone marrow, uh, we can uh, easily see, uh, I hope my arrows there as well, you can see this uh, macrophage with an RBC inside. And there's another one here with, uh, um, with additional platelets as well as RBCs, which are being degraded uh, there. So he had uh, HLH and this was uh, despite uh, being on dexamethasone for uh, about 10 days, uh, solumedrol as well as IVIG. So he was started on etoposide in addition to the dexamethasone. Unfortunately, his cytopenias persisted, ferritin increased, and he developed seizures uh, as well, uh, which were likely a CNS HLH. And over the next two days, uh, despite uh, additional treatment, uh, he expired. So I'll just quickly go over uh, HLH, uh, which is hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. It's uh, a diagnosis usually seen in infants, but can happen at any age. And it's a defect in the inhibitory controls of the uh, natural killer cells, as well as cytotoxic T cells, uh, where there is an excessive cytokine production and accumulation of these activated T cells and macrophages in various organs. HLH can have a familial genetic or primary uh, so these are different words used for the same kind of uh, history, or it can be secondary. Uh, secondary is usually uh, to either infections or cancers. Um, infections can be viral, bacterial, protozoal.
people. And so there are reports of all of these. It can also be uh, secondary to autoimmune disease and it's been reported in organ transplant recipients as well. Uh, what is interesting to note is that both primary and secondary are often triggered by infection. So just because you see an infection and that is triggering an HLH does not automatically mean that this is not um, a primary uh, HLH. So signs of HLH are fever, hepatosplenomegaly, rash, and then neurological seizures, ataxia, coma, and then you can also have retinal hemorrhages. The diagnosis uh, can be based on either mutation. So if you have familial um, HLH or genetic history or family history of those, you can check for mutations uh, or uh, five of the following eight parameters. So if you have five of them, uh, your suspicion for HLH should be high. So fever more than seven days, plenomegaly um, by exam of three centimeters below coastal margin, cytopenias involving all three lines, uh, hemoglobin less than nine, ANC less than 100, or platelet less than 100. Um, hypertriglyceridemias with uh, triglycerides of more than 177 or a hypofibrinogenemia uh, with uh, fibrinogen less than 150. Hemophagocytosis that can be documented either on a bone marrow, spleen, or lymph node, depending on the involvement. Ferritin more than 500, a low or absent NK cell activity, or an elevated soluble IL-2 level. Uh, the last two were not done in this patient, but all the other parameters were there, and he met all six of these criteria here. And at his previous admission, he had met five of these criteria. So in terms of treatment, um, if you look at HLH treatment in the 1980s, the survival was less than 5%. Uh, then an HLH 94 protocol was uh, started, which uh, will is a combination of dexamethasone and etoposide for eight weeks, and survival improved to 54% at five years. Um, and uh, at week nine, a cyclosporin is given. And for those who have genetic mutations, a bone marrow transplant is uh, done after uh, the chemotherapy regimen uh, and maintenance is done. Um, even with this, 29% uh, die before they get to a stem cell transplant and 19% are left with neurological sequelae. So because of uh, still poor outcomes, despite uh, the etoposide dexamethasone, uh, HLH 2004 was tried. Uh, and this study in 2017 uh, is published on uh, the 2004 protocol. And the changes that were done were early addition of cyclosporin. So at presentation, in addition to a etoposide and dexamethasone, cyclosporin was added. Early stem cell transplant rather than continuing to wait for maintenance. And then because of CNS relapses, uh, as well as neurological outcomes, they added intrathecal steroids to intrathecal methotrexate for those that met criteria and needed intrathecal treatment for CNS HLH. Uh, unfortunately, the outcomes with uh, the 2004 protocol were not any better than the 94 protocol. And so at present, uh, that's not done. Uh, and the five-year survival uh, is around 60%. However, the caveat is that this is predominantly a pediatric uh, database. And uh, these were done for patients who were less than 18 years old. So um, in terms of kidney transplant, uh, so this is a, a review article published by uh, Dr. Ponticelli in 2009 in NDT. And there they looked at all the published later literature before then. And there were 76 cases uh, in transplant recipients, kidney transplant recipients. Majority of them were in association with infections, predominantly viral infections, CMV, adeno, EBV, HHV8, 6, BK, parvo but also bacterial infections, as well as mycobacterial and protozoal infections. In addition, there were rare cases with uh, cancer, so T-cell lymphoma and angiosarcoma, but there were many cases with no obvious cause as well. The mortality was pretty high at 53%, but likely this is underreported because many of these case reports were of short duration and the long-term outcome may not have been uh, known by the time those case reports were published. The suggested treatment in this review article was uh, to maximize antibacterial antiviral uh, agents for those who had those infections, high dose steroids, even methylprednisolone, stop the other immunosuppression, though you can consider keeping CNI because uh, cyclosporin is part of the treatment for um, HLH as well. 
uh, and then IVIG plasmapheresis or etoposide based on uh, the situation. So another uh, adult uh, patient literature is uh, this uh, review article published in Blood from 2015, which is a how I treat a paper. And the interesting thing for adults that they note is that there is a significant overlap between primary and secondary. And hence, uh, physicians are now moving away from this terminology and moving to a familial genetic HLH versus a non-familiar or non-genetic HLH uh, kind of categorization. Because many patients in whom there is an infection that is triggering the HLH, there are genetic mutations as well. And so they would then also need a treatment with bone marrow transplant as well as chemotherapy. Uh, they do note that the 30 day mortality for this is somewhere between 20 to 44%. And the overall mortality is between 50 to 75%. And in terms of their treatment algorithm, uh, so history, physical lab, because suspicion has to be high for uh, this uh, as the diagnosis is rare, as well as there are other uh, etiologies like septic shock, as well as other things that you may be confusing these with, uh, or um, drug induced for transplant patients with all the immunosuppressives and myelosuppressive drugs that we give. Uh, and a pathological and genetic evaluation should be considered uh, for patients. Uh, and if there is a rheumatological disorder, then immunosuppression, and disease specific treatment. If there is malignancies, then uh, etoposide should be part of the chemotherapy. And if they're refractory, then moving towards allogenic stem cell uh, transplant. Again, in infections, uh, start with uh, antimicrobials. And if there is EBV or refractory, then uh, we should move forward to etoposide and consider going to a bone marrow transplant. And those who are familial or genetic should automatically be considered for the bone marrow transplant. And even those who are idiopathic should undergo genetic workup to evaluate for familial or genetic as they would need a bone marrow transplant as well. So uh, my take home messages uh, from our experience is one, uh, suspect HLH. Um, whenever you have a combination of cytopenia, fever, and uh, send the tests uh, as well as consider bone marrow. Uh, in addition, if you've diagnosed it, consider uh, primary HLH also, especially and send the genetic workup, especially if the patient is not septic uh, or if the patient has history of needing, like this patient had a blood transfusion requirement that seemed disproportionate to his kidney disease or even earlier than his kidney disease. Plus, he also had this childlike look and childlike behavior uh, raising suspicion for some genetic abnormality that he may have or a syndromic diagnosis that he may have had as well. And then an early referral to specialized center where uh, they would be more comfortable uh, to give etoposide and then move forward for even a bone marrow transplant uh, where uh, that might have been something that at his previous admission, if uh, with the HLH, he had gotten earlier treatment as well as etoposide and been considered for bone marrow. Maybe the second admission may have been prevented or the severity with which he had it might have been uh, lower. So uh, I will uh, stop here and uh, look for any questions or comments. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajay. Wonderful case uh, and actually a very challenging case. Uh, one is, first of all, the generally HLH is a pediatric problem. Mm -hmm. This patient is 30 year old. 30 year old. So yeah, do you think he had an episode in July? Mm -hmm. Was did it continue or kept simmering and it came again appeared now in September? Or you think it is a second episode? Now so I think the second yeah. episode. Your doubts about genetic uh, basis will be stronger. But if you think it is the same episode which is continuing, initially he received steroids in July, so possibly it subsided a bit, and then again it simmered up. What is your take? So I think both of those are possible. Um, he did get steroids, uh, did not get etoposide, um, and as the steroids tapered, his fever record. Uh, his cytopenias, though, had resolved by the time he got discharged. So, so from that perspective, at least, uh, it at least appears that his HLH might have uh, recovered. However, we don't have all the other parameters in terms of 
fibrinogen, ferritin, whether those uh, had all normalized uh, or not. Uh, in addition, like I said, there are a couple of features which are curious and raise the suspicion that his original disease um, was uh, he that he had HLH or some of that going back even decades earlier. Because he had, um, when you ask him in history, we don't have those labs, but he, even as a young child, he had had required transfusions even before he got to the kidney disease and uh, needing dialysis or a transplant. Uh, in addition, he had that kind of faces look, which raised suspicion uh, that there might be some kind of genetic syndrome that was going on. Uh, hopefully over the next one week to two weeks, we'll have the genetic report as well to confirm whether he had a mutation uh, and whether that mutation was there, which would then uh, kind of lead more credence to that this was likely repeated episode and the only way to completely cure him would have been a bone marrow transplant that he would have then required. But short of bone marrow transplant, which requires a planning, do you think uh, giving atoposide right in the beginning, because one point is in HLH, many times you are not able to fulfill all the five or six criteria. And possibly they say that even with suspicion, one should go ahead with the treatment. Yes. Is it that atoposide, if it was given earlier, uh, or the other way to put it is, do you think uh, if you had a case now, uh, would you have changed your plan of treatment? Absolutely. So now looking back, see, if I look at him, he was with us for about 10 days before we transferred him. And even after five days of uh, dexamethasone, and then uh, we gave him solimedrol and IVIG, his response to treatment was very, very slow. And uh, when he got a biopsy done, despite all this treatment that we had already given him, he had frank, florid HLH on his bone marrow biopsy. So uh, the biopsy image that I showed, uh, this was after 10, 15 days of uh, full dose dexamethasone, solimedrol, IVIG. And so at present, um, my thought would be that if we had given him etoposide up front, uh, the additional thing that I would say is he wasn't septic. So it wasn't like the other patients you have who have HLH, where they have septic, sepsis, septic shock, and then get into HLH, in which case your suspicion for that infection as the driver for HLH is much, much higher. In this patient, he came in walkie-talkie, overall feeling well, looking okay, other than the thing that you feel like, okay, he is having two months of fever, not eating well, not doing well. But he wasn't the septic shock. He was in the ward with us for 10 days before uh, we had to transfer him for the persistent cytopenias and hypofibrinogenemia, which was resistant. Uh, and then he was now developing bleeding uh, echimortic patches, which were new uh, despite this treatment. So I think those are, I think, uh, again, uh, pointers towards where I think it wasn't sepsis, septic shock leading to HLH and more likely a genetic driver for HLH. Uh, Professor Kher, sir. You know, I, I, I think... You also uh, partly, yeah, must have been involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had seen him, and uh, the... I think the message is very important that a high index of suspicion, then doing the appropriate tests at that point of time, and then once you have made the diagnosis, I think we missed the bus. We were, he was not with us in July. I think between July and September, I think his disease continued. I would feel that he had some minor kind of a remission in his disease, but his disease had not gone totally out. I don't think so. Because his fever record again within yeah. a very short period of time, he continued to manage his Fever, I think he didn't follow up at all uh, with a nephrologist uh, in these two months. And I feel that, I think that was probably what needs to be done in these patients. These patients need to be under very, very close follow-up. And I think his disease evolved. And by the time he came to us, his disease was non-responsive. And with us also, we felt that probably 
uh, initially he felt that once we gave him dexamethasone, see, on a clinical day-to-day -day basis, you feel he's feeling better, his fever is better. But as Ajay said, he didn't look that he was going to die in two weeks' time. He didn't look like that. He, he was looking reasonably good. And it's only that he deteriorated despite giving methyl prednisolone and all that. And then we have a family hemo, hematology consult as well. So, so it was being done, managed as a combination of that, that as well. But, but I think uh, multidisciplinary management uh, may be a combination of uh, uh, very active involvement of hematology at a very early stage in these patients probably would what would have saved him. And I feel that he missed this bus of two months, probably. And that was probably what, uh, what we, young man. Uh, and I agree with Ajay that probably the chances are that he may have had a familial or a, a yes. genetic predisposition. And I will, we will come back and inform us maybe in one of the next sessions as to what is the information about the genetic uh, mutations, if any, of uh, HLH in this patient. So, so I, I think, or we can update it on the WhatsApp group as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think, uh, Ajay, you well. did mention about uh, a series of uh, 72 or 74 cases 76. of 76. HLH. But how common cancer you have encountered in your practice, HLH in transplant patients? No, no. The transplant, there's only one other patient we had. He also died. Unfortunately, but he had multiple infections also. He had cytomegalovirus and he had uh, pneumocystis. And in addition, terminally, he had also HLH. But because I have seen HLH with cancer patients yeah. uh, who develop yeah. also renal failure. And we get to see these patients with HLH. Uh, so those have been a significant number of patients where HLH has been seen. In transplant patients, only one patient I had previously seen with uh, multiple infections uh, and HLH, and that patient unfortunately also expired, and he Problem did not respond to he did not respond to any treatment as such also, and uh, this remains a very important DD in such patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one gets uh, dissuaded by sepsis when the, there is some amount of cytopenia. So unless you have got good ferritin level or fibrinogen level. Possibly, you may not hit the diagnosis. That's right. That's yeah. why a very Can high suspicion. Can yeah, I yeah, Suman. Suman, yeah. yes. Sir, actually, I've seen two patients uh, with tuberculosis leading to secondary hemophagocytosis syndrome. And uh, what I've seen lately, actually, in CKD patient with pyroxy of unknown origin, sometimes we are unable to pinpoint where exactly the focus of infection so I started doing actually the PET scan instead of CT chest and abdomen and picked a few uh, lymph nodes here and there and we did the tissue diagnosis. And uh, then we treated the patient with uh, again steroids plus IVIG plus ADT. Because again, uh, we have to think, I think in our scenario also, the TB is very common actually. And uh, that's what uh, I want to add, actually. Ki oh, yes. Sometimes, yes. you know, the I TB also can seen, also lead to yeah. hemophagocytosis. I syndrome. have also seen with TB, but uh, really, I don't know how many, because you keep seeing in the ICU, he's a patient of HLH, he's this. I, you don't keep a track how many have survived. But yes. uh, logically, if possibly, infection is the stimulus, yes. which is easierly if you are able to manage the infection. Yeah. Possibly, and giving steroids and something, you can possibly salvage them. Yeah. 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 Tuberculosis, there are many times patients, uh, be it in transplant or in patients of chronic kidney disease. Yes, PET scan is a good diagnostic test uh, where overt uh, signs of TB are not evident. And that yes. happens very commonly in patients of chronic kidney disease as well as in transplant. And yes. we often have to resort to even though we may have done CT scans and all, but we often have to resort to a PET scan for making a diagnosis of tuberculosis mm -hmm. to find yes. out any, any lymph nodes. And yes. then treating many of these patients, you end up, the fever goes up, their ferritins go up and all that. The immune reconstitution uh, <laughs> syndrome develops and then many of them, 
you have to give steroids uh, for the fever to subside and continue antitubercular treatment and that that does subside over a period of time but that's usually a milder one not not very very flagrant and uh, that one sees with this but in an occasional patient probably maybe a genetic predisposition or something of that sort then these patients might deteriorate and i think infections remain very very important and i think that is probably been the one and cancer malignancy is another important cause for uh, hlh uh, that you see in the clinical practice but in transplant patients by and large not very very common but yes uh, once in a while you might have to yeah my dr ajay any patient. final comments by dr ajay yeah so i think uh, my take home like i said is that if you see hlh i would get hematology on board as well as maybe uh, they might even be uh, important for them to take over and you take a back seat uh, for this at an earlier time point even if it is a transplant patient um, so i think uh, that uh, would be one part and second is that um, as i was reading the literature they are moving more and more away from this primary secondary and talking more about familial genetic and so if you have someone who is hlh um sending the genetic work up earlier because many times they might be a genetic mutation and in which case they would recur down the road as well and so in that kind of setup you may then want to put them on maintenance or etoposide earlier than you would otherwise and so they would then uh, have that component uh, as well so i think those are two things that if you have it uh many times we assume it is infection or there is infection kind of staring us in the face uh, as in cases that dr suman lata was describing uh in which case we don't think about that they might be a genetic component or that they may recur down the road now we know that in transplant recipient infections remain dominant during first year uh your series of transplant patient when did hlh occur so majority of them were has occurred after 6 years or something yeah so major 2014 14 so 9 years this is 9 years 9 years yeah yeah so majority of them were within the first year but there were quite a few there was a significant fraction that was late so and again a uh, majority of them were with infections uh second was cancer if you look at adult patients who are not transplant majority of them are cancer and infection is second but in transplant it's the reverse majority are infection second is cancer uh and but there was a significant fraction even in those uh series uh, that dr ponticelli reviewed uh where there was no obvious cause found and so again in those patients also you would have to think that this is likely that this is a second hit kind of a model as well for patients who are adults who have hlh they have a genetic mutation and then something happens which could be an infection which could be a, a cancer and it is known even in those who have familial genetic uh, hlh that they do have infections as the trigger for their hlh to flare up so even in those who have genetic mutations it is now well recognized that the infection can be the trigger that triggers them to develop uh, the full blown hlh so any, any so i think indian data about hlh oh uh, i can't say that i i i can't say i looked for it i'm sure there is uh, but i can't say that yeah, i i think for, i think we reviewed it once in transplant mostly mostly cancer literature is full of hlh so but but there may be one uh, we'll have to look at literature to see if there is indian data on transplantation where hlh has occurred Hey, sir. I think uh, you will agree that both cases. Oh yes, yes. One case of N block a message to the audience that one should not. We also had one N block in RR, where uh, again the child was in the Limca book of records. It was that time seventeen, eighteen months old child, and majority of the children have got history of fall from the roof, and that is how they. Uh, get head injury and the organs become available so this was also a major child and the father gladly gave the children and this was liver transplant and kidney so n block should be kept in mind encouraged and that is a important source of organs and as uh, dr suman also mentioned if you compare 
the DGF, rejection, post-trust, hypertension, post-trust, proteinuria are identical. There is no difference between the adult population or if the end block is done, except the initially there is a higher risk of thrombosis because of the small vessels. And second, interesting, and said that secondly, then uh, development of aortic dissection. I mean, that's uh, nobody will think about that. That's a finding that it can also, because of low perfusion, can give rise to graft dysfunction. And second, again, an HLH very rarely encountered in, uh, if Dr. Kher has seen one case, the possibly majority wouldn't have seen any case of HLH occurring in transplant patients. And as the Dr. Ajay pointed out, possibly hit it fast, hit it hard. It may be genetic, it may be acquired or secondary, but the message is what he said is possibly the nephrologists have to take a back seat and give it, hand it over to hematologist that prop therapy, whether steroids, whether to along with etoposide early, maybe life-saving in these patients, though the output, the outcome, as he said, has improved to 54% five-year survival, which is pretty good, but keep in mind about that. I think for final comments, I'll request Professor K to say something. No, I think I don't have anything else to say, so I would say that uh, thank you both uh, Ajay as well as Suman for that wonderful cases, and I think it's been a learning experience. Uh, all of you will agree, those who have joined us today and I think uh, with this we must also thank uh, Microlabs and uh, um, Mr. Sharma as well as uh, uh, Raja. Uh, Raja ji and uh, Microlabs and uh, thank all of you for joining us for this another session of challenging cases in clinical nephrology and we will come back in two months, two weeks time and with another challenging cases uh, for the fourth edition and we hope more and more of you join thank you very much thanks ajay as well as thank suman you. for joining thank and you. i thank on you. behalf of thank you very much good night sir good night, good night. thank you dr bye suman bye bye, bye, -bye. bye.